Welcome to Masterclass number six. The topic for this session is all about what do you need to do to make an abundant no dig garden. So I've pulled together seven of my top tips that I think really help to make a difference with no dig gardening. But first of all, I wanted to talk about really what is a no dig garden. For me, essentially, no dig gardening is all about a natural way of gardening. It's about feeding the soil life and then enabling the soil to feed and nourish the plants. It's about building up an abundance of organic matter in the soil. And in doing this, it's really about top dressing rather than digging it through the soil. So it's following how nature works and 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 sort of, I guess, mimicking nature and try to set up a system that is really sustainable and natural. And it's a system that's ideal for home garden. And it's something that I've been doing for a really long time now, several decades. And it's something that I've done in many parts of the world. And I, I just so believe in it as a really positive and simple way of gardening that's just helped to build success in so many different contexts. So it's something that I'm really excited to be able to share with you and to actually walk you through some of the the kind of the tips that I've I've learned along the way. So why why do no dig garden? Well, I think I think it's a really important strategy because essentially as I said it's about mimicking nature. It's it's really a living design process. It's a process where you're you're identifying how nature works and following that through this way of gardening and it's a low disturbance way of gardening because you're not disturbing the roots and that's particularly important when you've got lots of perennial plants it's not deserve, um, disturbing the mycorrhizal fungi it's not deser- um, disturbing other life that's in the soil And it's also not disturbing weed seeds, which is often a really big problem when you're cultivating soil that you then also activate a lot of the the weed seeds that are in the soil end up with a big, big problem. So so this is a low disturbance strategy that actually takes quite a little amount of effort to get a really good garden happening. And it doesn't take that much time either. So it's not about being a lazy gardener. It's actually just doing something that makes a lot of common sense it's also i found to be a way to build up a garden system that requires far less watering and in the process of doing it you're also building the soil regenerating the soil systems so for me my experience of doing no dig gardening over a few decades that i've been doing it it really has enabled me to create really thriving and abundant food gardens with very little weed issues um, and also through the diversification very little pest problems and in in most of the year except for really dry times I have um, ostensibly no watering requirements so I, I think there are so many positives for really exploring no dig gardening and I encourage you to if you're not already, uh, to give it a go. So I did want to tell you that unless you, you might, you may have already seen it, but I have made a a YouTube clip about my method of no dig gardening. It's called how to make a no dig garden, Moro Gamble's method for simple abundance. Now you can find this on my YouTube channel, which is our permaculture life. And it's about just over 17 minutes. And I run you step by step through the process of, of making the garden, what you need to, what the steps you need to do and the things you need to do it. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely amazed this particular film has already been seen by almost 300,000 people. So obviously no dig gardening is something that a lot of people are interested in, in looking at. Now, I've got just a summary of this here. So these are these are kind of my six key steps. Now I wanted to tell you that there's a little bit of a twist in this too because there's something a little bit different about the way that I do no dig gardening as opposed to what you see in pretty much all of the books and all of the YouTubes and all of the other online materials that I've seen. And we're going to get to that um, as I explain this. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on the method itself because it is out there on the video and you're very welcome to go and, and watch that. And um, so 
The first thing that I encourage people to do is not actually to clear the land that you're about to start the garden on. Leave the weeds there. They're going to actually add into being part of your organic matter. They're going to be um, the roots as they die back in the soil, will be opening up channels in, in the soil. As the, the weed tops die back, they're going to be adding into the organic matter as well. So essentially what I try and do is to just water the area really well, maybe just chop the weeds back a bit if they're tall and just leave them on, on, on the ground. And then on top of that is where I start to add all the extra organic matter and soil food. But before I do that, I think it's really important to actually, particularly if you have quite a compacted site, is to open the soil. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so it's not a, not a digging and turning over, but sometimes I do think that it's important just to lightly um, open the soil with a garden fork without turning or or changing the structure too much just allowing a bit more lift and air in there I like to add uh, quite a, a, a good amount of soil food now this is a, a combination of compost material um, leafy green material maybe some chicken manure maybe liquid fertilizers and a whole range of things at this level and on top of that is where I put the weed barrier. That, and typically in my in my um, example that I've used, it's it's newspaper. Now, most this is where the twist is because mostly you'll find the newspaper is at the bottom layer. You'll see people say, "Okay, put the put the weed barrier on top of the ground. It will stop the weeds from coming up." from the ground now what I've found is that unless you're a master composter there will be no doubt there will be um, seeds in your compost and what I found too is that I can actually gather a whole lot of materials from all around my garden which include weedy materials and I can mix this into this organic matter soil food layer be underneath the newspaper to enable me to really add in as much material as I can at that point. So by putting the weed barrier on top of all that, it does a few things. One, it allows you to have a whole lot of materials as I've just explained. The other thing is that it actually helps the new soil food to be integrated with the soil below and to activate all of that the soil organisms rather than being separated by a layer of thick newspaper so i think or cardboard now so i think that's a really really important thing um, and the other thing is that on the top the newspaper also uh, helps to provide a kind of like an insulation layer that protects um, particularly in the warmer climates I've found it protects the compost from being from the nutrients from being evaporated or from being dried out too much now one other thing that I've noticed too if you have the newspaper on the bottom and you plant into the compost on top um, it the, the plants dry out too quickly so essentially in this system here you're actually planting through the papers you can see over here in number six where the newspaper is actually what I see as being the layer, your topsoil layer. So you pull back the mulch that you've thickly put on top and you plant your seedlings in a handful of compost um, up to about the layer of the newspaper. Now I think this is a really important point because too many times I've seen no dig gardens where people are just planting into that very thin layer of compost on the top and it just dries out. And also if things grow up, I've seen um, corn crops that have just kind of blown over because the roots get to the cardboard and just go sideways. So I, I highly recommend that if you're going to do a no dig method that you rethink where you put that cardboard or newspaper layer and it's unnecessary, absolutely unnecessary to put it straight on the ground simply for the fact that it's going to separate your new soil, <clears throat> new soil food from your soil organisms and also you um, you're you're going to have to plant through it anyway so you may as well put it on the top so you can see really clearly where it is so i hope that gives you a sort of a bit of an overview and hopefully as i'm going through all the different um key points that i wanted to mention from now that you'll get a, a clearer picture of this so these are my seven top tips about that add on to those of how to really create an excellent um 
uh, no dig garden. So the first part that I really wanted to talk about was this one of opening because it's been something that people have um, given me feedback about on the film. It's like, well, if you're opening, it's really not a no dig garden. So I just wanted to have a little chat about that because really what this is is about just gently forking and just opening and give a little bit of lift into the soil and it's really as i mentioned particularly on new areas so you can see in the picture here that's quite a compacted piece of grass behind where where the people are, are starting to open up the soil there and it's if it's somewhere that has been compacted or walked on or it's a building site or you can you can just feel that the soil is really hard it makes such a difference i've done lots of trials over the years and i've worked out that you you can actually make a no dig garden without doing the forking but it somehow just through that opening enables everything to get activated and allows roots more easily in it allows the soil life to um, colonize that area more easily and it means that the whole garden system seems to just come to life far more rapidly. Now, when a, once a garden's established and you're wanting to add more materials on top, uh, I just gently open it if I feel that the soil is starting to get a bit compacted. And I don't do this all the time. And I'm quite careful because particularly around existing perennial plants, you really don't want to be disturbing roots. But sometimes it's important just to add a little bit of lift again before you add more materials on top. But really it's about using your own judgment and checking to see whether you need to do that. But I never turn it over because, you know, the thing is that soil life is creating its own layers and its own um, structure. And if you start to turn that, you actually upset that whole uh, structure of, of how how life has set up the, the soil system underneath. So I really think um, just a gentle fork is a really good way. So one of the things that I try and tell students when they're in the garden, once you start to fork, now this may seem absolutely obvious and I, and I, and I apologize ahead of time. Once you fork it, make sure that you actually don't step back on that soil again and really identify before you are forking it where your pathways are. So you work from a point and you fork it backwards and you only step on the bits that you haven't done or on the pathways. And then so as soon as you step on it again, you've just compressed it. So there's no point. I did apologize that ahead of time. <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, the second point that I really wanted to mention was about activating areas of soil. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that I really find very useful in a garden is to set up compost bins or worm towers in an area of the garden where I know that I'm wanting to create a new section of of um, no dig garden or I'm wanting to uh, replenish an area of no dig garden. So rather than having compost bins in one particular designated spot within the garden, I actually move my compost bins around my garden site. So I look to where the areas of my garden that seem to maybe need the, the most attention in terms of building up their sort of their vitality again. And that's where I place my compost bin. So I allow my compost bin to, to be filled up and to seep down. So these bottom bottomless compost bins actually leach a whole lot of fantastic nutrients into the side they're attracting amazing amounts of life into that part of the garden and you get this thriving activity going on all around pluming around where your compost bin is and all you need to do simply when you're wanting to get your garden happening lift off the whole bin spread it out and then put the the newspaper and um and hay on the top and you're ready to the store on the top and you're ready to go. So these type of ideas of uh, just simply activating in situ, I think are really, really important. And I know that it's helped me to get some fantastic gardens going, particularly again, if you are in an area where you have quite compacted soil. So, you know, you may even if you try and do this 
um, really strategically, you may even be able to get away from even doing the forking. So you're, you're getting your worm friends to actually do that opening for you. Uh, so compost bins in situ and um, worm towers really help, or even just simply, if, if you don't have any of those, just getting a bale of, of straw and just putting it on the spot where you're wanting to get some activity happening and water that in well and just let that rot down before you know it you're going to have an amazing lot of soil life there because it's being protected from the sun it's providing food for the soil life it's actually getting a whole lot of things happening there so that's my tip number two so tip number one was to open your soil tip number two was to activate the area tip number three is really about thinking about your soil moisture. Now, once you start to add layers of compost materials and your newspaper layer, and then your, your hay on top, um, your straw, sorry, I should say. Um, I, I often use those words interchangeably, but I, I know I should be saying straw. So I'll, I'll try and be more consistent there. So the straw is just the, um, often I just use um, grass, from the local farmer that's baled up and I find that as being a really affordable and really useful material to use in the garden because all you need is something that's seed free and that will is biodegradable so I find that to be one of the cheapest things you don't need to go for anything like your lucerne's um, because you know they're probably more nu nutrient dense and would would end up being more beneficial underneath your newspaper layer than on top of it so just talking a little bit about soil moisture one of the things that I really try and do if possible is to actually build a no-dig garden after it's been a really good rain there's something about the the quality of the soil getting um, beautifully wet after rain as opposed to it just being hosed or you know watered in some other way so when possible I let the rain do the job and then I time my gardening based on some really good rain soaking the soil nicely. Um, if I don't have that though, I need to find a way to actually get some water into it. So um, as you can see in this bottom picture down here, we're starting to set up a no dig garden and um, we're actually watering each of the layers. So we water the, the soil first to make sure it's nice and moist. And then as the compost layers are put on, we'll be more, um, making sure that's nice and moist. When the newspaper layer goes on, that's moist. And then when the hay straw goes on the top, that also gets watered in as well. So the whole system is really nice and moist. Because any of those parts, whether it be the base soil, whether it be the compost, the newspaper or the straw, if any of those are really dry, it's just going to be sucking moisture out of the system. And when you plant into it, you're going to have trouble. So really the idea is to make sure that this is really a lovely moist environment to start with. Now the other thing as you can see below here I've written water. Slow it, spread it, sink it, store it. So these are some things to remember in terms of your overall management of water in the garden. Um, you might be able to see in the in the little picture there there's little keyhole pathways that help to direct water into the garden to slow it and then from the end of that keyhole it gets spread and that helps to sink it and store it in the soil so that's one way of, of using that kind of strategy in in situ in the garden and that's also another reason how you can actually maintain soil moisture rather than diverting water away from your um, no dig gardens through pathways or by having raised beds when your garden beds are in the soil and when you're able to divert water that's either runoff water or uh, rain water that's being collected directly into where your plants are growing, this is a really important thing to do. Now, sometimes the main picture here, what I'm, I, I'm, this is only a garden that's in process because I never leave my soil open like this with the soil exposed to the sun particularly in my subtropical environment it's a really important thing to cover the soil because um, soil like this would just get baked very rapidly and you just notice how quickly it just desiccates and becomes dry and dusty whereas when it's nice and moist like this you can look at it you can feel it. it's like a a moist sponge and it's lovely and alive and 
and um, dark colored. So sometimes what I do, if I know it's going to rain, I might just open the soil a little bit, wait for the rains to come and then toss on some more compost and some more uh, straw on top of that. And once once I found that the weed light cycle has been broken by having a newspaper layer in for a season, actually it may not be necessary for the next time. Now I'll talk a little bit more about newspapers in, in a section coming up because I think it's a really important topic to explore as well. But just another point on the soil moisture. One of the things that I've noticed too is that it's actually a good idea to before you water just to check the soil moisture underneath I found actually you need to water these gardens far far less than what you normally expect with a standard garden and you can quite often over overdo the watering and cause problems so I just sort of stick my finger in underneath and feel what the soil moisture is like and get a sense of it like that before I go ahead and do any more watering and it's quite remarkable actually how much you you notice that it it needs it less the other thing about these gardens too is about by having more perennial plants and more deeply rooted plants you're able to to water less too so i just wanted to talk a little bit about the design and how through your design you can encourage more life in the garden now a really important thing that i've noticed with the no dig gardens um, is that it does really cultivate an amazing amount of soil life underneath underneath the ground you can you can dive in there and you can find just so much going on now if you have lots of little gardens that are separated by quite compacted pathways so all your little garden beds are separate little entities you don't get as much life so what I mean by this this point designed for life if you can design the layout of your garden that there is connectedness between each of your garden beds so that the soil life as it activates particularly if you think about you know mycorrhizal fungi spreading from one section to another and enabling you know worms and other organisms to start to connect all of the different sections of your garden this is where the design comes in so I encourage you to create perhaps bigger areas with some soft edge paths, maybe just those little keyhole pathways that I've mentioned. You can see from my little diagram here too. And I've shown you this picture before in some of the previous master classes that I've done. So there's a main contour that's water, a water collection pathway as well. And off that are just little tiny little keyhole pathways that give you access into that larger area. So you don't have to be stepping on the soil in the larger area and compacting that. And they so they double as being water collecting pathways, um, but also they don't cut off the whole entire garden beds from one another. So there's this con connectivity that happens along that whole terrace. So you're actually encouraging life to flourish along there. And I've noticed an enormous difference in the capacity of the soil and the capacity of those garden beds to produce a number of different layers and an extraordinary amount of food in a small area because not only are they the plants actually accessing the, the soil um, nutrients deeper in because mostly they're perennials there's also this great sense of vibrancy in the soil because it is a much broader area that's being activated now newspaper is another one of those topics that I that I notice has been quite a, a, a an issue to to explore so I thought I'd, I'd talk about it here now I I have always used newspaper as a strategy for helping me to establish no dig gardens. Now, as I said in a previous point, it's not something that I use consistently all the time throughout the garden. It's an establishment practice. And, I, and I've and i noticed that it's definitely the benefits far way outweigh any of the, the, the problems, I think, in terms of actually in incorporating newspaper in this system and you know I encourage you to explore the facts about this too and to make up your own mind but I just wanted to share a little, a little bit about what I've found but also how I use the newspaper to best effect 
Um, so as far as I can see, um, that the EPA has imposed regulations to prevent um, the heavy metals being used. So instead of heavy metals in the colours, there's now synthetic pigments. And instead of um, petrochemical carry oils, um, soybean oils or other vegetable oils are being used as the carriers. So it's not the, a lot of the the fear about newspapers and particularly with colours has come from um, the previous uh, information about newspapers. So it's not to say that there's nothing in it, but my uh, my research has showed that actually there's no sort of dioxins in bleaching anymore, and the the heavy metals have gone. The heavy metals have been taken out of it. And so for just a small amount of newspaper to do an enormous benefit, um, I find it's absolutely um, in, indispensable in my, in, in my opinion anyway. So how I use it. Um, so for example, on the, on the left side here, I have a picture of how I use the newspaper when I have existing plants there. So I actually wrap around the 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 um, existing plants, the perennials or the trees that are there or the worm towers. and But before I do, I, sh I reshape my pathways and I scoop the material from in my pathways and toss it up on the top. I'll be adding extra compost on top, so I'll top dress those. Now, I, I either use the newspaper when I'm first establishing a garden or if a garden's been going for quite some time and there seems to be a few weeds that have come back into the garden and needs a really good replenishment and that's when I would I would use this strategy. So you can see there how I've actually bring the newspaper down into the little pathway ditches and those pathways will also be covered with newspaper as well. I left it off there so you can actually see that pathway. There's no point having a pathway without it on because otherwise, you know, the weeds will come up through that and just spread through it. So my ideal is to try and create as much coverage all the way around so that the whole garden is completely, um, you know, managed for pests, uh, for, for weeds, sorry. And what I would do too here is as I'm coming to the edge, I'll bring the newspaper over the edge of the new, of the, the grass on around the edge there and so that you have this really good barrier all the way right from the pathway through all the little pathways over all the little garden beds. Now in the middle here you can see a bit of a, a couple of strategies that I've used. Now one is that if I'm up against the edge of a wall and it's really good to start a newspaper from an edge, a solid edge, I tuck it in because there's nothing, you know, there's always, it's on those edge points where you find that little weeds will find their way up. So if you've got an edge, an edge of a garden bed or an edge of a pathway, tuck it in. Now, just going back to this, to, to the pathways, I've actually avoided having little rocky, little rock edges or little brick edges or anything like that because I find they just become points where lots of little little weeds can find their way through. So the, the bigger the area you can just have the newspaper going all the way over, it seems to get rid of all those little um, sort of annoying little weed spots where they can come through. Um, so just back to the middle picture here. Um, it's a bit of a slope coming down towards us here. So what you can see I've done is I've actually laid it in a way that it's reverse of a, a roof tin, for example, where you're shedding water off. Here I've laid it in a way so that as the water is running down the slope, it's actually able to go underneath. So it is actually still harvesting um, the water through the way I've laid it. Now the other thing too, once you start to plant through this, when you've got your mulch on the top, when you push down on that, you're actually creating these little indentations. So people often worry that if you have newspaper, you're going to be shedding water. What I found actually, you can use it to best effect by firstly doing the layering in this way, but also creating these little bowls. So when the water falls on top, of the mulch and the newspaper comes down and gets directed naturally through gravity into these little bowls and just becomes it just goes straight into where each of those plants are so it can actually really help and then on top of that a really important point is to cover it completely if you can see the newspaper the newspaper is going to be 
um, damaged by the sun or the wind, drying it out, which will then crack it really quickly. So to get the best life out of the newspaper in terms of uh, making sure that it's really going to act as an effective weed barrier, the best thing is to make sure that it's covered completely in the pathways, in the in the um on the tops around the edges and besides it's not a very attractive thing to be looking at now another thing um, that i always do um, some people worry about it blowing away so i always soak it in a in a little um, bathtub or tub of water before i put it on but not just put them all put them all in at one go because by the time you get to the bottom pile in the in the tub they've all turned to pulp so really what I do is I just dunk a few in for a few seconds at a time and pull them out so enough of them to just get um, soaked through but not turn to pulp and that way too they'll end up being really effective you can lay it even though even if there's a bit of a wind and you're not going to just break it down too quickly so you know even a simple thing like laying the newspaper there's lots of little tips and tricks which you can really help you to make the best effect out of this um, i tend to not add the pathway paper right to the very end so then we can start to put the oh, the hay the uh, straw on it i keep doing that don't i putting the straw on it before you walk on it is is what i encourage people to do because once you start to step on newspaper if it doesn't have the straw on it you can actually rip it a bit and again um, that makes it ineffectual so typically 10 pages thick is what I find useful um, moistening it layering it so it's harvesting water and covering it completely now planting into a garden like this can be a little bit different from what people are used to because you don't have the soil on top and you're just putting your little seedlings or seeds into that. So what I what I typically do is I grab a transplanter that's quite a narrow little digger like the one I one, one that's up on the top left and I make a little bird's nest in the hay and poke a hole through just straight up and down with the digger and put a handful of compost in that hole and then plant my seedling and you can see that being done here in the middle so a nice handful because what happens when you put the digger in sometimes you can press some of the materials or push it away that's underneath and just to make sure that your seedling or your large seed has some good secure connection with the soil underneath a nice handful of compost will do the trick it's also a handy trick in case you've mixed a lot of your compost material with other leafy greens and materials to bulk out your compost that you actually have your plants in connection with soil not all that material now uh, you can also plant potatoes simply do the same thing just open up with a little hole and put your potato in that spot and it works absolutely brilliantly um, you can if you want to plant things like carrots what i do is i will scribe a line i'll pull back the mulch in a line i'll scribe a line um, open up the newspaper in a line put a, a handful of compost along that line and then sprinkle my seeds in that spot so you can still do all the normal sorts of planting that you want to in this type of system um, as much as as much as any other way but what i do really encourage people to do is to really get a lot of deep rooting perennials into the garden so things like this welsh onion on the right this is a plant that i've had growing for 23 years or more maybe now i started growing it in a in a veranda um, in a share house in the city a long long time ago and has traveled with me as i've come and i've moved it around the garden and i've um, handed out thousands of cuttings from it but it's still the main bit of it still in my garden and so I just leave it there and I mulch around it and I add more compost onto it and I ju it just keeps going and going and the other things will self seed and, and move on but those sorts of plants stay there that and sorrel and garlic chives and um, also things like the sacred basils um, lots of different things uh, at the moment now I've got Okinawan spinach and Suriname spinach and Brazilian spinach these are all perennial things that are in my garden that are deep rooting um, deep rooting which means also that I don't need to disturb the soil as well and all I need to do every now and then is to just add extra compost on top and some extra mulch and then I actually can um, really create a very low maintenance garden in this way 
Um, if I want to replant into this no dig garden with all those perennials around, maybe an annual's finished, a, a lettuce is, is finished in that section, what I might do is just take out that lettuce, put a little bit of extra compost in that spot and plant something else. Maybe I'll put a basil in that spot. Um, so you can actually replant the garden without redoing the whole section. So often people ask me about, but don't you want to do, you know, um, rotational beds? Um, I actually don't do rotational beds because I have so many perennial plants in these gardens that there is and there's such a diversity and such a mix of plants that I don't get an accumulation of issues in the soil. Um, so I just have sections that are my main salad beds and I'll kind of swap things around in that spot. But the whole bed typically never really gets cleared. Every now and then I may um, clear a section that I really want to kind of just really put a whole lot of new compost in but it's not as part of that rotational bed it's about actually just getting as many um, perennials in as possible as much um, richness in the soil that keeps getting added to and built to and and I do a lot of chopping and dropping in situ as well which is one of the things that I wanted to mention as well which is identifying and collecting as much of your local abundances in making these gardens. So the picture on the left is is collecting my own mulch from finished vegetables. So for example, this is a pumpkin vine that's finished and I collect sweet potato vines and, and finished corn and finished beans and all different sorts of things that are finished. And I use that as mulch in the garden and build up and add on to my garden. I also grow a lot of things like comfrey, which is this plant in the middle. And I'm consistently grabbing armfuls of the leaves of that and, and laying it down as mulch or actually even better still underneath the mulch as part of the um, to build up the organic matter and to feed the soil. Um, and where I can too, I collect local um, local mulch source. So it may be my own homegrown mulch. It may be um, mulch from a local farmer. So always though, I'm looking for something that I can meet the need from within my own garden system. If I can't meet it from my own garden, then I'll look perhaps to my to my neighbours, my neighbourhood. Um, so just coming back to my garden. So, you know, I even grow things like um, edible canners that that I can eat the bottom off, but I regularly chop the tops off for mulch. I have tree crops, um, maybe acacias or pigeon peas or polonias, which can be chopped and dropped and used as mulch material. Um, as well as the comfrey, I also collect manures from my chickens and I've got lots of compost systems going around. Um, so there's there's a lot of different things that you can collect and make in your own garden, worm farm materials. Um, in your neighborhood, maybe you can find other sorts of things. Maybe you're in a rural area or a peri-urban area and you might find some cow manures or horse manures or um, someone's done a big slashing of an area and you can go and collect some grass but I'd be really I'd really want to make sure before I introduced grass from externally that it's not coming from an area that's had a lot of chemicals sprayed on that um, and then you might want to look beyond um, beyond your local neighborhood and what's in your region so for me every now and then I'll be importing perhaps if I've it's a, a low amount or I'm trying to redo a big area I might actually import something like a mushroom compost every now and then from the local mushroom farm or there might be um, a need to get some extra mulch if I've run out of my mulch materials and I really need some extra things but I try I try to grow as much mulch as I can on site and of course the newspaper so I, I actually don't have newspapers coming into my own household so I put out a call around the neighborhood and um, other people gather from their friends as well and and so that's something that's more of a, a regional one but I, I encourage you to to have a look around your garden have a look around your neighborhood and have a look around your region and try and identify what are the things that could be useful in your garden and then to start to collect them because one of the things with the no dig garden 
you actually don't necessarily need to to buy anything. It's really a matter of stockpiling things. And when you have enough of a stockpile to get the first bit going, you get that happening. And then you connect on to that one for the next bit. So start small, start local, start close into your house, and then gradually collect more and more materials and add on as you go. So just as a as a sort of a recap and a couple of extra points. So leave the grass and the weeds in where your garden is getting started and just add on top of that. Add compost and extra organic matter it might be um, comfrey or canna or any other leafy greens that you can find around typically i would add anything in there except for things like gum leaves or pine leaves which actually have the oils in them that sort of repel plant growth but there's so many other things that you can grow around and i even use weeds because on top of that is where the weed barrier is going to go so you know there's all sorts of things that are you can find in and around your neighborhood that you could actually toss into that spot and then i plant so densely you can see this same little bit of garden is here behind the the aloe vera on the the top right hand side it's starting to get um, some really good growth happening and as you can see in the bottom left hand it's really starting to dense become quite dense here now and it's really close to the house so i can just walk straight out of my off my veranda which is you know my kitchen opens out onto that into the main area of my garden so it's all very close to the house and it sort of radiates out from that and this is the same garden here in the middle on the bottom it's the exact same garden as above there and that's when the diversity is really starting to flourish and a lot of those perennials are there and things are starting to self-seed and it's just flourishing and then a little bit later when all those annuals are finished the perennials are still there but I've I've opened I've opened up the soil I'm adding more compost and then I'm going to add more mulch on top and plant into that so you know parts of it get redone other parts other parts um, just stay as they are and keep evolving and keep changing. To summarize um, again about the no dig garden strategies, the seven tips that I've talked about, it's open first, activate your soil, check your moisture, make sure you're not actually going to be layering in over the top of something that's quite dry. Making sure that you're designing your garden, that you're encouraging as much life in your garden as possible. Rather than separating and making little boxes, allow the life to flourish and connect. So you're designing for connectivity. Put the newspaper on top. So this is, instead of on the bottom, flip it. So it's a it's a upside down from the typical no-dig garden diagrams. Um, the number six was really about trying to get as many perennial plants in there as possible so that you're getting deep roots and less disturbance and number seven is looking to find your local abundances so i don't offer a direct recipe if you must use this and this and this it's really about what are all those materials that you can find locally in your environment and what are the mulch materials you can find locally in your environment really it's a it's an approach it's a way of thinking about your garden and you find the things in your particular area that are going to be able to do that job effectively. So I hope this has been really <clears throat> helpful for you in, in uh, thinking about how you might be able to set up your, your no-dig garden. As I said at the start, this no-dig garden method is something that I've used for decades now. And I've used it in all different contexts. And um, I've uh, since I put the film out about a year ago, I've had people sending me pictures from, from lots of different parts of the world also saying how successful it's been for them and it's revolutionized their way of thinking about their garden and the way that they've actually been able to create so much more abundance without having to deal with the weed issues, without having to water so much and creating a really vibrant and healthy garden. So thank you again for attending. It's been a delight. Um, to be able to share this with you um, I really encourage you now to stick around and, and ask some questions I'm going to turn the chat on and you can um, um, type in your questions now and we can uh, explore this for as long as you like to <music>